want to say, first of all, I want to pray. I want to say, Lord, give me the grace right now. Give me the confidence. Give me the courage, Lord, to speak with discernment right now and understanding, Lord. Allow me to speak through souls right now. Allow me to show what God has been doing in my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Whew. All right, all right, family. Well, woman of God, men of God, I want to start off by saying thank you. I want to thank Pastor Ray, Sister Crystal, for everything that you do for this ministry day in and day out. You know, I want to thank my cousin Angel. I want to thank my, my uncle Johnny. I don't know if he's here, but, you know, he invited me to this church. And, man, I don't even know where I would be if I didn't step into this church. It was, in La it was just in April. And I got to say that the Lord's been moving. A lot, a lot has been changed in my life, and I feel the change continue to occur and occur and occur. You know, I want to start off by saying, you know, um, it's only been a few months, and I'm proud to say that I did receive a new identity in Christ. And what I, thank you, thank you. And, and family, what I mean by that is, it's the way I think, it's the way I see things, it's the way I feel as these days. You know, everything that I encounter, Lord, if it's an obstacle or a challenge, I'm just noticing it's it's going much smoother, and I'm able to accomplish things that I wasn't able to before. I'm able to have a positive mindset. And I know it's just the Holy Spirit. I know it's the Holy Ghost moving in me. And, I, and I'm just grateful for it all. You know? Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Um, I want to say a few months ago, I was stuck and confused. I was stuck in the world. I was searching for purpose, for wholeness, for happiness, just a feeling knowing everything was going to be okay. I was in a toxic relationship living in fornication. I was controlled by the spirit of lust, and I felt weak. I was smoking weed like crazy. I couldn't go a day without smoking. I had to smoke just to eat, just to sleep. Anything I had to do, I had to be high. Man, I started doing drugs at the age of 14. I'm 27 now, but I just want to, I was just trying to fit in. I was trying to find a crowd. I didn't have my mother or father at one point in my life. And I noticed that's when I decided to take everything in my own hands. I started selling drugs freshman year, North Hollywood High School. I was chasing money. I made profit, you know, I was, I felt powerful, I felt like a boss, you know, but 14 years old selling ecstasy, weed, you know, I, I became popular in high school, you know, from all ages, all grades, you know. I ended up becoming too popular to the point I ended up on the dean's list, you know. This, this list was, you know, gang members, drug dealers, taggers, you know, any bad influence, he or she was on that list. And, you know, so I decided, let me transfer schools, let me transfer districts, actually. I ended up moving to John Burroughs in Burbank. I didn't... <laughs> I didn't move there to start a new way of life, though. I was thinking rich kids in Burbank. I was thinking white women. I was thinking, <laughs> just being honest, I'm just being honest. But <laughs> I thought I was going to live a more fulfilled life. All I did was dig a deeper hole. I ended up getting through high school, graduating, but I was still seeking. I was still trying to find something to make me, you know, full in my heart. Man, it was deep, it was deep. You know, this is when the parties came, the hard drugs, the alcohol, plus more women. And I'm not talking good women, I'm talking bad, toxic women. I was still selling. This time it was different, it was a different ball game. I ended up pushing any drug I could lay my hands on. Any drug, you know, all I was thinking was hustling, stacking bread, you know, uh, meeting women, you know, relationship on relationship, you know, and I was just lost, I was confused, man, but, I ended up getting addicted to Xanax and cocaine. Plus, I never stopped smoking weed. From the age of 14 to 18, I was a weed head. From 18 to 25, 26, I was popping pills, doing cocaine. <sighs> but, it was till this year, the Lord, the Lord delivered me from all these substances, <laughs> delivered me from the spirit of lust. And I'm grateful to be standing here today, healthy, strong, renewed, a, a, a cleansed mind, restored. It's a blessing to know anyone can start all over no matter what you've been through. Truly, nowadays I walk only by faith and not by sight. <laughs> it's crazy. When I say I walk by faith, man, just this last May, I gave myself to Christ in April. And May comes around the corner, I get laid off on my aerospace job. I, at first, I was a little confused, but I knew, man, this is God. You, you're making a new door for me. You're making a way for me, huh, Lord? 
And it's crazy because I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy at that job. I was praying for a way out. The second I prayed on it, the next day I literally got laid off. Man, it was crazy, but I just knew, wow, God's really, he's shining his light, the spirit on me. He's, he's putting things in position for me. Man, so as I go, you know, um, it's a blessing to know. In, oh, wait, I'm sorry, Lord, sorry. <laughs> but since I got laid off of my job, he's been giving me his daily bread every single day, just enough to pay bills, just enough to get by. But I feel something I believe. I believe something is coming in my spirit that will happen suddenly. I believe we are in a season of suddenly where God is going to bless us suddenly. He's building his, he's building his children up and giving them the boldness and the courage to step into their destiny. Whew. He's calling many to their promised lands and purpose. Crazy that just a few months ago, I was completely in a different place. God is a God of suddenly, I tell you. One day, Paul was killing Christians, and the next day, he was a Christian. You know, God snatched David from, God switched David from a sheep boy to a king in one moment. God can do the same for us in just one moment. That's just a reminder, family, that God can change your situation in just a second. Don't get, don't get discouraged by where you are now. Things are about to turn around for the good and for the better. The abundance is overflowing. And family, that's really all I got for my testimony, but I, I hope you guys loved it. Amen. Thank you, guys. My, my brother's on fire. My brother's on fire. Come on. I, I, I think you need to come to my life group, bro. <laughs> oh, man. Amen. 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 So right now, it is my honor. It's my honor and my privilege. You know, I've, I've known this brother for a long time. Um, man, I saw him back in the days when he had the big old brooch. You know, he, had the, he was old school, you know. Um, you know, he, he was, he's my, he's my family. He is my family, you know. He was, yeah, he, he's my family, you know. He's, he's technically my uncle, you know. Um, and it's an honor, you know. It's an honor just to see him, what the Lord is doing in him and his family's life, you know. And, and what, what's happening and how they're growing, you know what I mean? Just for saying a simple yes and amen, you know, it, it, things can happen. Things can happen, you know, like Brother Brian was saying, you know. Um, just, you know, Paul, you know, he was from killing Christians to becoming a Christian, you know. And that's what happens to each and every one of us. We're, we're in the world and we're, you know, we're killing, we're making fun of Christians and Bible thumpers and all. And then look at us now. You know, look at us now. Amen. Amen. So I, I don't want to take no more of my brother's time. Amen. So if we could all please stand. And we just give a round of applause to Brother Bobby. First of all, I want to thank Jesus for calling me out of the grave um, and saving me. Um, I, I always acquaint myself with, um, with Lazarus because uh, he, was, he was dead already. And that's, that's the way I was before Jesus called me out of the grave. I want to thank uh, uh, Pastor Ray and Sister Crystal for allowing me to come up here in this, in this holy, holy, holy area right here to, to preach what the Holy Spirit has put in my heart. Um, and everything that you guys do for the church, it's, it's appreciated. Sometimes I may not say it, but, but I mean it. Um, you know, God put the Holy Spirit in me to, to prepare this message. Uh, uh, Sister Crystal asked me earlier if I was ready. I said, I've been ready for like three weeks. Um, so you guys can sit. But, but I've been getting attacked. I've been getting attacked all the way up to um, 10 minutes before I got in my car to come here. It was bad. It was so bad. Um, for those of you that are close to me, you'll know um, what happened. It was just so bad where I was this close to calling pastor and, and just, it just I couldn't come. I could not come. It was that bad. Um, my little girl, Gracie, she... Um, She's gotten in the habit when she sees stuff going on at home, she'll walk up and start praying without even asking. And when we got here, when we pulled up over there, we, we had like 12 people in my little Corolla. 
I don't know how they fit. <laughs> and, and, and the first thing Gracie said, Dad, I think we're here because me and Raymond prayed. And I said, that, that's exactly why we're here, because you prayed. So there's been quite a few situations. Uh, our, our truck broke down, so that's why we're in the little car. Um, just, just over and over situations of, of God not wanting me to come here. Um, I want to go ahead and start. The, t- the title of my message tonight is Paul's Thorn is a Blessing. I don't think he saw it as that right away. but um, So go, if you have your Bibles, please open up to 2 Corinthians 12.1. First of all, I want to say something else. Uh, somebody asked me if I was nervous today, and I was like, how could I be nervous to come up here and, and, and talk about what God has done in my life? You know, how could I be nervous? I mean, I, I was thinking of coming up here, because I, I think I have like 20 minutes. I was thinking of coming up here and just laying prostrate, prostrate right here. And for 20 minutes, what would people think? Because that's what we should be doing. And that's nothing, that's nothing, com- you know, compared to, to, to the worship that we should be giving God, to the, to the gratitude. You know, laying, laying prostrate is nothing. Um, so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know, and I know this man, whether in the body or out of the, but, or out of the body, I don't know. Only God knows. This man was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even I should choose to boast. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain. So no one will think of me. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Let me pray in. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord, to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to come up here, Lord, for honoring me, dear Father, to come up here and speak your word, dear Father, and speak some of my testimony, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everybody that's here. And for those that are not here, dear Father, we pray that somehow, some way, you will touch them at this moment and let them know, Lord, that you are with them, dear Father, whatever their situation is, dear Father. We pray, Lord, that someone here will be touched, Lord, that someone here will, will walk away with, with something different in their lives, the way they see their situations, dear Father, in your heavenly precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, I'm, a, I'm part of a group, a group text, and, and uh, the brother Paul, Paul Marquez, who's now in San Jose at the UTC, he texts in there, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. He had no idea I was going to talk about 2 Corinthians 9. So, so I, I showed Patty, my wife, I was like, look, man, this is confirmation. Um, and the Holy Spirit was speaking uh, and, and even in the green room right now, when the brother was talking about stuff, you know, it's like, wow, this is more confirmation, you know. It's, just, it's, it, it's confirmation that what I'm about to talk about is, is, um, is the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul was speaking of himself when he talked about the third, the third person. He was speaking of himself, that God had let him view paradise. God had let him see and hear certain things that nobody else knew. So can you imagine how big your head could get if, 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 God pull, if God pulled me up and showed me a glimpse of heaven and, and gave me these power to come back and start blessing people and healing people? I don't know. I think my head would get pretty big. I'll be walking around like this, you know, like, you know. So, so Paul, Paul knew that, that, you know, he had to remain humble. Because he was humble, he speaks of himself in the third person. So God revealed these things to him. And, and, you know, I, a lot of us, including myself, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit up here and talk about the specifics, but, you know, I've been blessed in my life. I've had money. I've, I've had power. I've had, I've had authority over, over uh, situations and circumstances and people, right? And, and I don't think I, le- I ever let my head get big in those situations, which is probably why I'm still alive today. You know, uh, a really good uh, influential person, and I'm not going to say his name, just passed away recently. And that was confirmation to me that I got out of that lifestyle at the right time because I would be shucking and jiving right now if I was still in that lifestyle. This person was very influential. And, um, you know, the, the sad thing about it is I know he did not know the Lord. 
and he got killed violently. This was recently, like a week or two ago, you know, and, and I saw it on the news, and, and I was like, oh, man, you know, I, I, could, I could have still been in that lifestyle. I was so close to this person, you know, but God, God pulled me out of that. And I thank, I thank uh, uh, the people that have been in my life, you know, even though I was in prison for, for 29 years of my life, I thank those individuals that, that hammered it into my head that, that humility was a way to go. My mom, who was always involved in gangs and, and, and that lifestyle, always hammered it into my head. Don't go to prison thinking you're all that. You're going to get killed. So I, I, thank, I, I thank the Lord today that I'm standing here. So Paul continues, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan was sent to torment me. That, that really stuck out to me right there in that scripture that a messenger of Satan, of Satan was sent to torment him. And, and, and we have no idea what it was. We just know that, you know, to me, torment is like, you know, I, you know my daughter bothers me a lot, but she doesn't torment me, right? <laughs> I'm talking about Gracie, in case Bella's in here. Um, so can any of you think of the thorns in your life? I think it was very intentional that, that, that Paul never said what the thorn was because we all have different thorns. We all have different thorns that we live with to keep us humble, to keep us from becoming big-headed. And, and, you know, I'm sure if we, if, we, if we sit and think about it, we can think of, of those people that are probably thorns in our lives, right? Or those situations that are thorns in our life that torment us. Um, so I'll share a little something with you guys. So, so this morning, you know, I wake up thanking God that I have one more opportunity to, to glorify him with my, with my life, one more opportunity to share his word with somebody, one more opportunity to praise him and worship him. You know, that's how I wake up. But then I notice something I couldn't swallow. And my, my, the right side of my face was like stuffed. But it didn't feel like mucus. I just couldn't swallow. And so I get up. I'm a hypochondriac, for those of you that don't know what that is. One little cut, I'm bleeding to death, right? Uh, I get a little pain in my back. I got some cancer or something, you know. So, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm walking around. It's early in the morning. It's early because I'm going to work. My wife is asleep. She doesn't have to go to work till 2. So it's like, okay, you know, I'm walking around the house like this, you know, trying to, try, in my mind, I'm turning blue already, Right? <laughs> And, and, and my kids are asleep, and I'm like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? And I look at my wife. She's sleeping. I don't know. For those of you that are married, sometimes you don't want to wake up your spouse, you know, especially if they're trying to get some rest, because that, that's a whole different subject right there, right? So I say, I stand, I'm standing by the bed. I'm looking at her, and I'm like, uh, uh, babe, babe, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I say, I, I can't swallow and I can't breathe. And, 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 and why are you waking me up? I got to work today. And, and she's not looking. She's not opening her eyes. She's still looking the other way, laying on her pillow. And I said, I can't breathe. I, I can't swallow. I think I need to go to the hospital. That's how I felt. And she goes, well, get some water and salt and gargle it. <laughs> so, you know, I, now I'm walking away. Like, I think I'm turning blue. And, you know, thank God I'm here right now, right? I, I was, I wasn't, it wasn't that serious. But my whole point, my whole point is, is, is sometimes I can be a thorn to my wife, probably more than sometimes. I think I've been a thorn in her life since I met her, to tell you the truth. You know, I mean, uh, it, you know, we, we as people can be thorns in, in the people that we love without realizing it. You know, so she has to live with that. She has to live with that. You know, there's no cure to that. There's no healing to that. I have to cure myself, right? I have to heal myself. Jesus has to heal me. Right? Jesus has to do a work in me. I'm sure I'm not as bad as I used to be when I first met her, though. Right? <laughs> and then, you know, the situation that just happened recently. Um, so Paul continues in verse 8. Um, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been studying that for a long time. How, how can my weaknesses uh, uh, be strength? You know, how can my weaknesses be strength? So what does it mean? God, uh, God's grace is usually defined as undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. So, so we don't deserve God's grace, but he still gives it to us. Freely, freely gives it to us. It means that God chooses to display his power in us by sustaining us 
in our weaknesses. Think about all the ways God has displayed his power in your, in your life through your weaknesses. I'm standing here right now as a testament that through my weaknesses, I'm made stronger. Through, through the things that I continue to struggle with, God continues to show me grace. It's, it's like I was in the green room and I just broke down, you know. I broke down and started crying because I was thinking of the situations that happened in my life. You know, from, you know, growing up, being born, my mom and dad were both gang members. My mom was from, from Pacoima, my dad was from San Fernando, so that's like, that's like a, a, a oil and water. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mix, and it's like, you know, how did this happen? So, 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 you know, while I was being conceived, they were doing drugs. While I was being conceived, they were both 14 years old when I was born. And, and they, you know, they continued doing drugs during the pregnancy. You know, I know all this because I was raised by my grandmother, and, she, and I would ask a lot of questions. You know, my mom continued to do drugs until she died at 49 years old from heroin and cancer, and, and she just stopped, she, she would not stop using. And, and that's, that's, you know, it, um, that's, what, that's what I'm getting around to. Um, you know I, I know, I know that we believe in healing here in this church. I know that we believe that, that God can cure anything. I believe that. But I also believe that, that sometimes we heal a little bit slower. You know, I called, I called some brothers to get their opinion on this, you know, because I don't want to be up here talking, talking about nonsense. I want to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. So the Holy Spirit put it in my heart to, to let you know that if you're still struggling with, with uh, a, a certain addictions, you know, if you're still struggling with, with, with certain cravings, um, if you find yourself doing stuff that you thought you were healed from, don't get discouraged. God is doing a work in you. You know, I, I mean, God has revealed his grace in me since I was born. I mean, at six months old, I had, to, I had to have surgery on my ankle because I was severely anemic. I have a scar this big. So you can imagine how big that scar was when I was six months old, right? Uh, uh, shortly after that, my appendix burst. I was 12 years old. They told my mom and my grandma that I would not survive. You know, after that, I had an accident. I went through the windshield of the car to take away the conceited that I was. Believe it or not, I was a good looking guy before. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's hard to tell now, but I was, I was a pretty handsome guy. <laughs> and, and God said, okay, this, this is what I'm gonna do to you. If you, get, if you get real close to me, you can see that my eyelids look like jigsaw puzzles. That, that's how much glass went into my face. Uh, I have a scar this big on my stomach. I have a scar on my hand where I broke the steering wheel. So that, that humbled me, that humbled me. Um, so, so those are thorns that that have been taken from me. Just two years ago, I was in the hospital um, because my gallbladder uh, was, was that close to bursting. Um, you know, it's, it's like, my, they told my wife, he'll be in there for three hours, it's gonna be quick laparoscopic surgery. I was in there for eight hours. They had to reopen the scar from my car accident from 1989. I woke up and I was, you know, like, what the heck is this? They said, well, you, we, we couldn't take your gallbladder out because it healed with that scar. So they had to reopen it and clean out all, all the, the scar tissue to get the gallbladder out. You know, and that, that was another situation where I just completely surrendered to God. And, you know, the next day I was home. And, you know, finally, I want to get to the, uh, to the affliction that I'm talking about right now, which is my thorn. My thorn is my disease. And the disease that, that my mom and dad were doing before they conceived me, that my mom and dad were doing during the pregnancy, that my mom and dad were doing after I was born, that I started doing. So I was already doing drugs before I was conceived. I was already doing drugs before I smoked my first joint. I was already using drugs and struggling with drugs and alcohol. And I continue to feel these cravings. I continue to, 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 to have triggers. But through the glory of God and his grace, he keeps me sober. And slowly but surely, I am healing. One of the biggest mistakes of my life, and some of you that know me already know, I think it's, it's one of my biggest failures. But at the same time, besides my salvation with God, it, it became one of my biggest accomplishments in life. In 2016, um, 
my wife and I were struggling with drugs and alcohol. I took the, I took the kids away from her. And uh, I thought I was going to do a, a better life without her. And um, shortly thereafter, um, I received a phone call from the Department of Children and Family Services that they had picked up my two sons. Um, you guys know my sons. They picked up my two sons. They were, they were five and four at the time. And they called me and said, hey, we picked up your two sons at school. Um, we need you to bring the baby into the, into the office. I don't know if, it, I don't know if anybody, any of you can understand the pain that you have when you have to hand that seven-month-old baby, which is now Gracie, into the arms of DCFS workers at the office. And my two sons are standing there asking me, Daddy, are we going home? And, it, and it's like, yeah, just, just, just go ahead and, you know, you're going to go home. Go, you're going to go home. And, and I left. And I never came back. I had already reserved my, myself in thinking that they're going to go to a better family. Somebody's going to adopt them, somebody that, that they deserve. They don't deserve the life that they have with me or my wife. But through the grace of God, one more time, God had different plans. And, and, and it's so difficult for me to stand up here and say this now because I had already reserved my mind. I had already accepted the fact that I was not going back for those kids. Because I went from that DCFS office to the hotel and got high again. And I would break down in tears. During those, those times when nobody was around, I would break down in tears like a baby. And then start getting high again. Finally, four months, uh, five months went by and... And me and my wife had not seen each other. We weren't married at the time. We split up, and, and I called her, and I said, hey, what's going on? You know, we, since you know, we got our kids taken away, might as well get high together, together again. And she's like, I don't know what you're doing, dummy, but I've been visiting my kids for two months already. So she was already sober. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? She goes, yeah, you want to see the kids? Come to McDonald's over here and so-and-so street, and you can see the kids. And I went, and I was high. I was still high. And then I celebrated that day. I celebrated because I said, at least my kids are going to go back with their mother. At least they're not going to get adopted out. That was my justification. That was the devil telling me that you don't need to get sober. You don't need, they're going to go back with, their, with, with the mom. That's good enough. But once again, God spoke to me. And he had a plan for me. A plan that I accepted. And a plan that I carried out. And I said, if she can do it, I can do it. And, and, we, and I started getting sober, too. You know, and I started visiting my kids. You know, it, it, uh, on the 19th of this month, it'll be six years that they've been home. Yeah. And I think, I think that's seven days from now, right? Um, so, you know, ad addiction has been a thorn in my life even before I was conceived. That, that's, that's the thorn that I deal with, Right? Um, I haven't I haven't gotten high in, in, in it's been over over eight years now, you know, or, or, or I haven't done anything. I've been I've been like totally uh, faithful to my wife. That, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. You know, I, I haven't done any alcohol, any drugs. I haven't even thought about it. But sometimes these triggers come. Sometimes these cravings come. And I pray and I pray. And I thank God that I have those cravings. I thank God that I have those triggers because without that, I probably would go back. So I think that was Paul's message, that he was given this thorn and God was not going to take it away because his grace was good enough. And when we start accepting that, that God's grace is good enough, whatever illness that you have, you know, keep in mind that, that addiction is not just drugs and alcohol. Addiction is behaviors. Some people are addicted to, to drama. Some people are, yeah, they need drama in their life. They need drama, and if they don't have it, they will manufacture it. Because they need, to feed, they need to feed those endorphins that make you feel good in your brain. I'm a certified counselor. That's why I know what endorphins are. Nice. And, 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 you know, on that, on that note, I did not want to be a counselor. That's the last thing I wanted to do. But once again, God had different plans, you know. And, and you know, I went to school, and I became a counselor. I'm trying to be a therapist. Um, I don't know how that's going to work out, but, you know, it's, it's like uh, God gives me sign after sign that I am in the place where he wants me to be. And I, I'm continuously um, uh, sharing the word with my, my employees 
I have like 50 employees. Half of them, half of them are, 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 are believers, and the other half are totally different. Totally different. <laughs> Raymond knows what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, we, we try to minister to everybody, right? So, so you know, there, there's one addiction that's called co, co-occurring or codependency. Codependency, which is the most difficult of all uh, 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 addictions to treat. And, you know, sometimes people look at you and say, oh, you know, the, the, the guy's a drug addict or he's an alcoholic, you know, and, and you know, they're sitting there judging you. And, and, and then they go home and, and, and they cause this drama with their, with, their, with their partner or their wife or their husband. They cause the drama, not realizing that they're also addicted to that stuff. You know, co, uh, codependency, to give you a brief explanation of what that is, because some of us here might be suffering from that and we need to pray about it is when you're so worried about the other person's well-being that you let your own life go down. You start, you start worrying about what is, what is he or she doing? Where are they at? Are they okay? Do they need money? Do they need help? And you're the one that needs the help. You're the one that needs the prayer. So you're praying for all these people, not realizing that you need to be praying for yourself. So... If, if, if you're suffering from any kind of um, thorns in your life, whatever's going on in your life, um, I don't know how much time I have left, but so seven has been a big number today, right? So I have seven quick things that I'm going to that I'm going to explain to you that that uh, uh, they're Bible verses. And I think these these situations will help you or at least you can pray about it. Um, one of them is 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 unconfessed sin. So you're probably like, why, why am I not getting any better? Why am I still suffering? Why am I still uh, 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 using drugs? Why am I still arguing? Why, why hasn't have my, my behaviors changed? Why do I still have the behavior of being on drugs and I'm not on drugs or alcohol? Why do I have these behaviors? Because you probably have unconfessed sin, right? And that's something that, that it says right here. Confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And that's James 5.16. A lack of faith. You know, sometimes we sit up here, we get on our knees in the altar, and we've got our hands in the air. uh, But there's really no faith going on right there. You know, we walk outside and start praying for people. But our faith is, is lacking. Our faith is lacking. As soon as we get in our car, we start worrying about everything that's going on in our lives. That, that's, that's a good sign of lack of faith. In Matthew 9, 20, 22, Jesus healed the woman who had suffered for many years with constant bleeding. Jesus then, Jesus, Jesus healed, who, Jesus then had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the finger she touched the, uh, the, the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. That's a lot of faith. She didn't even know him. Just to just say, if I touch him, I'm going to be healed. That's a lot of faith. The third thing, failure to ask. If we don't ask and earnestly desire to be healed, God won't answer. When Jesus saw a lame man who had been sick for 38 years, he asked him, would you like to get well? That may seem like an odd question from Jesus, but immediately the man gave excuses. I can't, sir, he said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Failure to ask. And uh, I think this is the fourth one, need for deliverance. I can speak on this one because um, some of you know that I used to be all into that stuff. I used to read cards. I used to read palms. Um, you know, in the valley here, they used to call me a brujo. You know, it's because I was all into that stuff that got passed down from generation after generation. My mother was into that. My aunts were putting spells on each other. It was, it, my cousins were, were putting spells on each other. It was crazy stuff. And that's what I was doing before I got saved. And now that I got saved, I noticed that my discernment is stronger. It's stronger in the Lord because he finally pulled me out of that. And sometimes, sometimes we need deliverance. We need to be prayed over. Scripture also indicates that some illnesses are caused by spiritual or demonic influences. 
And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's Acts 10, 38. A higher purpose. We may not understand it at the time, but sometimes God desires to do more than simply heal our physical bodies. Often in his infinite wisdom, God will, will use physical suffering to develop our character and produce spiritual growth. So when we're going through stuff, we either continue, continue to believe that he's going to heal us, continue to believe that he's going to make us better, or we go the opposite. Why am I going to church? Why am I praying? Nothing's happening here. I'm not getting any better. Because you want it done in your time. Or it could be for God's glory that you're suffering. Sometimes when we pray for healing, our situation goes from bad to worse. I think the brother here said he was praying about a job, and the next day he lost his job. Sometimes it goes from bad to worse. When this happens, it's possible that God is planning to do something powerful and wonderful. Something that will bring even greater glory to his name. Amen. And that was confirmation, which you, what you said up here, brother. Finally, God's timing. I just said it a minute ago. So, we all have to die. Um, but we all, must, we all must die, right? And as part of our fallen state, death is often accompanied by sickness and suffering as we leave behind our body. He will wipe every tear from their eye, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Revelations 21.4. And that, that's, that's the final one, God's timing. Sometimes, um, you know, we want things done. But even if God never completely heals me, I want to be in my deathbed with the same faith that I have today, then. Because, and I'll leave, you with, I'll leave you with this. As a wise man once told me, it's a win-win situation. Because no matter what, I'm living a pretty decent life right now. And I know I'm, I'm hopefully I go to heaven, right? So I'm going to go ahead and pray out, guys. Uh, as as the, the, who's that, Chris? Brother Chris, if you could start praying, uh, playing the music. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, dear fathers, and thank you, Lord. Thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you for, for the word that you bestowed upon me, dear Father. I pray, Lord, that, that someone here was blessed and that someone here will go home with a different mindset, dear Father. In your heavenly precious name, Jesus, amen. So as we know, this is a life group takeover, and it's also prayer night. So I want to invite you to come to the altar and pray and, you know, thank God for, for those, those hardships going on in your life. Thank God for the blessings that you have in your life because they're both equally to God. They're both equal to God. Thank you.